um, our last speaker in this session is uh, Dr. Van Zee, who's professor of surgery at Cornell Medical College and attending breast surgeon at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, she is a clinical researcher who has um, developed um, many clinically actionable and practical nomograms that are widely used in the field of breast surgery. Um, and a particular interest of hers over the years has been DCIS, and she's developed a nomogram looking at predictors of risk in this patient population. Um, a lot of her data is based on a very uh, detailed, prospectively collected data registry on patients with DCIS. She'll speak a little bit about that today, um, as well as um, insights about the DCIS nomogram that she's developed with her colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Venzi. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation today. My talk is going to be much more pragmatic. If, if your research becomes, achieves its goal, my talk is no longer necessary. But I'm going to talk about what's available right now here, here today. So the problem with DCIS today, as you see a patient in your office, is there are so many different viable options for her treatment, and all of them result in excellent survival, but local recurrence rates vary widely. And the challenge is for this individual woman sitting in front of you to help her choose the option for her particular situation and her individual personal value system. And I think inherent is that in that is estimates of risk of recurrence. Those are essential to help her optimize this decision-making process. We know there are two adjuvant therapy options that help. Tamoxifen reduces the risk by about a third in ER-positive DCIS. Aromatase inhibitors help a little bit more but neither improves breast cancer survival for DCIS, and both have potential medical and quality of life side effects such that uptake for DCIS is quite low. There are four randomized controlled trials showing that local recurrence is reduced by half in women that receive radiation. Again, no difference in breast cancer survival, and there are rare but potentially serious side effects, including radiation-induced malignancy and cardiovascular disease. So there have been ongoing efforts to identify subgroups at low risk of recurrence in whom adjuvant therapies, and in particular radiation, are not necessary. There were three prospective excision alone trials that all attempted to identify low risk women, wide margins, non-high grade disease, small size, and all of them did achieve um, an outcome with a much lower risk of local recurrence at 10 years, ranging in the 10 to 15% range, much lower than the unselected DCIS patients in the four randomized trials. In that group, the unselected group, 28% recurred at 10 years, whereas in the selected low risk population, it was in the 10 to 15% range you can see here. So clearly, using these three factors, we are able to identify women that are at somewhat lower risk. How do we then translate that to a woman sitting in front of you? Well, we looked at our patients at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering that, as Shelley said, were very carefully prospectively accrued over many years, and we had about 3,000 patients that over 700 were followed for at least 10 years. And when you do a multivariable model on these various clinical pathologic features, you see a whole lot of them that are statistically significantly associated with local recurrence rate. They're listed here in bold. Let me take a little closer look at these three that are highlighted. So time period. I was shocked at this one. So after putting all these different variables in the model, simply the time period of surgery and treatment um, was associated with a much lower risk of recurrence, a 25% reduction in risk in the more recent years as compared to the earlier years. How can that be? Because this model already accounted for better mammograms because, you know, more people had a clinical uh, radiologic presentation and more radiation was used in more recent years, so that is accounted for in the model. I hypothesize that perhaps radiation is more effective now. The way that they do the radiation is more targeted or their boost is better or something. So we looked at the patients that had radiation and we saw no difference at all in the early years versus the later years. All of the improvement over time was limited to those without radiation, such that the women treated in the more recent years had a 40% reduction in risk as compared to the earlier years. So currently, women receiving treatment for DCIS today that are, do not have radiation have a much lower risk of recurrence than those seen in the randomized trials where it was 28%. Exactly why that this is is probably due to better pathology, radi radiology, not radiation, radiology, um, but we don't really know. Age. 
we took these same 3,000 women and stratified them by decade of age. And here you can see that the oldest women had a much lower rate of recurrence at 10 years than did the youngest women. The youngest women were 38%, oldest were, 90, were 9%. Um, and even on multivariate analysis, when we included all the other factors to control for them, the magnitude of the difference was even greater, such that the oldest women had an 80% lower risk of recurrence than the youngest women controlling for all other factors. Last, margin width. We know margin width is the only potentially modifiable risk factor. We can't control someone's age. Um, and so what about margin width? Well, when we looked at the same 3,000 patients by margin width, we had a hint that maybe wider margins was a little bit better, but not statistically significant. And so then when we stratified by radiation use, that's where we could see that all the benefit in um, or all the association with margin width was limited to those not receiving radiation, which actually makes sense because radiation kills residual disease. So among those not receiving radiation, there was a large difference. And even after, again, adjusting for all the other factors, there was a very large difference by margin width among those not receiving radiation, a 70% reduction in risk among those with the widest margins as compared to those with positive margins. Now, remember there is a margin width guideline for DCIS, but this only applies to women receiving whole breast radiation. So for women receiving whole breast radiation, two millimeters is, um, per a consensus um, guideline, the optimal margin. But for women not receiving radiation, wider margins are associated with a lower risk of occurrence than, um, uh, than narrower margins. So these are just three examples of clinical pathologic factors that are associated with risk of recurrence. How can we include these and all these other ones to optimally integrate them to help the woman sitting in front of you in clinic? Well, we've created this nomogram to do that, and it's, it's available online at www.nomograms.org, free of charge. It produces a five-year and 10-year risk estimate. But the key question with any predictive tool is how good is it? The two commonly used metrics for a predictive tool are calibration and discrimination. Calibration is simply how well the observed matches the predicted. So a perfect calibration curve is there noted by the, uh, the line with a slope of one indicated by that red arrow. And here you can see our internal calibration was quite good with all the dots lined up on that line with a slope of one. Um, the nomogram has then been tested and validated in at least five other independent populations around the world. And here's an example of a calibration curve um, from a population in Belgium. And again, you can see the dots are lined up along that line with a slope of one. It's not perfect, but it's quite good. Here you can see in a community population from Harvard and Kaiser that, again, the calibration is quite good. You can also see there are low lows here with the lowest risk group being under 10%, and high highs, with the highest risk group being 50%. And that's important because that implies a good discrimination or risk separation. Which brings us to discrimination. Discrimination is the other metric which simply um, tries to measure how well risks are separated by the tool. A perfect, perfectly discriminative model has an AUC or a C index of 1, and a completely useless model like flipping a coin has a C index of 0.5. Just so you have some context of commonly used predictive models in the field of breast cancer, the Gale model, the Adjuvant Online, and the Oncotype DX for invasive cancer have AUCs in the 0.6 to 0.7 range. Um, and our nomogram compared favorably 0.69 to 0.7 on the internal um, discrimination. You can see also in the independent external validation, it also compared favorably on the order of the same as the Oncotype DX for invasive cancer. So the DCS nomogram has excellent calibration in independent populations. It has low lows and high highs, and that's important. And it's good, not perfect, but good discrimination around the same order of magnitude as what we see in other useful tools. And it's free of charge. But what about other risk estimators? There are two commercially available genomic tests, the Oncotype DCIS score, which is a 12-gene assay. It was refined in 2017 to include some clinical factors, and I'll go more into that. And the Decision RT, which is a 7-gene assay, and it included clin clinical factors right from the beginning. But note, I am unaware of any published calibration or discrimination measurements or assessments, and there's no real good proof of accuracy. 
These are the genes that are included in both of the assays. The only ones that overlap are the KI-67 and the progesterone receptors. And these are the clinical pathologic variables that, are, that do overlap and are all in the nomogram. So because there are no published assessments of discrimination or calibration, I used the published data and created my own here. So across the bottom here, you see the low, DC, low intermediate or high DCIS score. And what were the actual observed 10-year local recurrence rates? This is from the original Solon paper. So low was 11%, high was 26%. But interestingly, intermediate was worse, meaning it was better to have a high score than an intermediate score. So this is not a good calibration curve. Also note that the delta between low and high is only about 15%, so not a very good spread. This is the same thing in a population from Ontario, Eileen Rakovich. And again, intermediately, intermediate um, score was associated with a higher risk of recurrence than the high score. When they looked at invasive recurrence as the outcome, the same problem. So I propose to you a novel predictor. Here with low, 9% risk. High, 38% risk, so very wide delta. And intermediate is intermediate between low and high. So look at this calibration curve versus this is Oncotype DCIS score. So what do you think? I would say mathematically, this is a much better calibration curve. But what is it? Age. It's the data I just showed you. So if you put age and all these other factors together, you actually get a very robust, very predictive model with a, a wide separation from low lows to high highs, lining up with pretty good calibration along that line with a slope of one. Eileen Rakovich took that Ontario population and created a model with four different clinical pathologic fa factors and the DCIS score. And what was interesting is the magnitude of the effect of each of those individually, age, multifocality, tumor size, DCS architecture, was greater than that of the DCIS score. This implies that the clinical pathologic factor is predicted better than the oncotype. She also showed that if someone had high risk clinical factors and a low risk gene score, the actual rate of recurrence was 30%. If someone had low risk clinical factors and a high gene score, the actual local recurrence rate was 10%. So clearly, the clinical factors trumped the gene score. She went on in a bigger population to do these calibration curves with a, a new model, including seven clinical pathologic features. And here on the left, the calibration curve is just from the clinical pathologic features alone here. It's quite good. This is internal calibration. When she added the DCIS score into the model, it didn't appreciably change. It did not improve it. If anything, it looks a little worse on that. And the um, discrimination C index went from 0.68 to 0.70, which is very marginal improvement. So that 97% of the prediction was due to those seven clinical pathologic factors, and there was not a significant appreciable change with the addition of the DCIS score. So then a refined Oncotype score appeared on the Genomic Health website in late 2017. Um, it was based on a combination of subsets from the original ECOG population and this Ontario population and incorporated three clinical pathologic factors. Note, this is a very important point. In the population in which it was de um, developed, about half of the patients used tamoxifen. But tamoxifen is not included in their prediction. So therefore, that implies that for every single woman that one uses it for, it's going to be wrong because it's going to be too low if the woman doesn't use tamoxifen, the risk estimate. And the risk estimate is going to be too high if she does use tamoxifen. A very astute breast pathologist from Montefiore noticed after this refined DCIS score was available that the prediction from it seemed to be exactly the same as the nomogram estimates. And she came to me with these 59 patients that were all over 50, less than um, two and a half centimeters, negative margins. And we calculated the nomogram estimates with and without tamoxifen use, and then used the single refined Oncotype score, because there's just the one. And we defined them to be concordant if the refined Oncotype score was within one or two points of the range we saw with the nomogram. And what we found is that 92% of cases, they were concordant. Here's a plot of all 59 patients. And um, just to orient you, each line is representative of the nomogram risk with and without endocrine therapy, and the circles represent the concordant oncotype predictions 
with the squares down at the bottom representing the discordant ones. So to blow up a section and focus on patient number two, the nomogram estimate if she takes endocrine therapy is 4%. If she doesn't take it, it's 9%, where the oncotype estimate is 6% whether or not she takes it. So we deem this to be concordant. And what you can see when you look at this is overall there's a lot of concordance there. When you look down towards the bottom, you do see there's a, a lot of nomogram estimates without endocrine therapy where they're much higher than the oncotype scores. And what you notice about those patients is they all had close margins. And in fact, all the discordant cases were those with close margins. Remember, margin width is not in the oncotype prediction. And remember what we learned already in those with clinical attributes that are discordant with the gene score, the clinical attributes tended to be more predictive of reality. Furthermore, those discordant estimates had a very low, very, very low estimate of recurrence of under 10%, even though there were close margins. And in our data, people with close margins had a 27% risk of recurrence. In those select low-risk populations, they did not achieve under 10% other than in the one study that um, most women use tamoxifen. So even in these highly selected women, we couldn't get a recurrence rate of under 10%. Yet the refined oncotype DCIS score predicted very low, under 10% recurrence rate in most patients with close margins. So I think this cannot be accurate. So the refined oncotype score is concordant with the nomogram in 92% of patients, probably because the predicted value is mostly due to those clinical pathologic factors, and the actual genomic test does not seem to add much. Among the discordant estimates, the refined oncotype score seems to underestimate risk, and this could lead to inappropriate emission of radiation, especially in those with close margins. So the refined score is inherently imprecise because it doesn't include the tamoxifen use, so it's going to be too high or too low depending if you put in the, depending if the woman uses tamoxifen or doesn't, so it's inherently less precise. It's less accurate in the um, close margin group. It takes about two weeks to come back versus immediately available in clinic at www.nomograms.org, and the cost is over $4,600 versus free. So I make a plea to all of you. Before we adopt any expensive new genomic test that claims to predict outcomes, we should demand metrics of predictive accuracy, some objective measures that they actually work, calibration, discrimination, and we should demand rigorous proof of significant added clinical benefit over and above those of free of charge, freely available, non-commercial tools. So to help a woman with DCS decide among many treatment options that we have, um, I think a recurrence risk is really helpful. And at present, the DCIS nomogram appears to be the best tool that's available. Thank you. And remember, it's free of charge. Right? It's free. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, it's 2 o'clock on the dot, and I apologize, but there is oh, the oh. next session that's coming in, which is entitled uh, New Targets and Strategies for Immunotherapy. Um, I'm sure many of you will want to stay for that. And I'd like to thank everyone on this panel for a really invigorating discussion. Thank you. Thank you.